As designers, we often get stuck in our point of view rather than the point of view of the people using what we create. What's up, many experts are here at eBay Design, and my guest today is Ellen Lopton. And Ellen is a designer, writer, educator, and curator. So Ellen is a senior curator of contemporary design at Cooper Hewitt and Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City, and director of the Graphic Design Master program at Mika, which is Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And she also received a AIGA gold medal for lifetime achievement in 2007. So Ellen has authored and co-authored numerous books on design, including how posters work, beautiful users, graphic design, thinking with type, and more. And of course, her book, Design is Storytelling, just this book right here. This is the book we are going to talk about today. So Ellen is an expert when it comes to, you know, demonstrating the power of stories when it comes to graphic design. And that's why I really wanted to have her on our podcast to talk about storytelling in graphic design. Hello, Ellen. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on our podcast. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. So first of all, for our listeners, I wanted to say that the book is a great resource for all types of designers, graphic designers, but not only. So if you're listening and you want to amplify the narrative power of your work, I would really recommend you to check out this book. I really like how Ellen presents us with different tools and techniques, and there are beautiful illustrations as you guys can see. So it really makes it interesting to go through and read the content of the book. And Ellen also shows us a lot of examples so we can understand the concept behind it. Okay, so the premise of the book is that good design is just like good storytelling. It brings ideas to life, right? So whether we design an app or a page layout or a website, we actually invite people to enter a scene and lead them on a dynamic journeys, right? So basically you teach us how to use narrative techniques to create better graphics and better products and experiences. Okay, so in your book you categorized all the tools, all the different techniques into three acts, right? Action, and emotion, and sensation. So let's talk a bit about each of them and perhaps some of key tools, okay? Sure. Okay, so the first act, which is action, is all about patterns that underline stories, right? So for our listeners, think designing the experience of unboxing a gadget, for example, opening a bank account and so on. Uh, So in your book, you say, quote, design is an art of thinking ahead and predicting possible futures. So Ellen, can you just talk to us about this first act about action and perhaps you can give us some of the key tools and techniques that you described here? Of course, sure. So every story has action, right? A story is not just describing the castle. It's what happens inside the castle, right? The people fighting, the war, the famine, right? (laughs) The action. And that's what people remember about a story is what happens. And action can be something very big, right? So an epic poem or 10 episodes of a Netflix show is a very big action with lots of parts. Or an action can be very small. So like pushing a button on a website is an action that's very quick, a micro action. But just like a bigger story arc, that action has to have the sense of beginning, middle, and end. It has to have the invitation to do, right? The invitation to enter, the physical and emotional experience of actually pushing the button, and then the sense of completion, right? The feedback that something is finished. And so we can talk about stories as having an arc. And this is a way that novelists and filmmakers talk about crafting a narrative, that the arc starts at a low energy point. You have a hero who's invited to solve a problem or find something, right? Achieve something that is difficult. And the action builds and it comes to a peak. And then the hero goes down the other side to a point of conclusion. So it's a little bit like a roller coaster. And if you think about being on a roller coaster and you start low and you're dragged up the side of the hill and you're literally physically building 
energy. The higher you get, the more energy in the car of the roller coaster. And when you get to the top, it's a climax and it's something that you have anticipated. And then whoosh, all that energy is released in the satisfaction yeah. of coming down the other side of the mountain. And so in, in design, we have to think about the interactions of users or someone looking at a poster or looking at the cover of a book and having that sense of entering, being satisfied, right? Experiencing what the message or promise of a service or communication is, and then feeling the satisfaction of finishing. And that is really the essence of every story is that shape of beginning, middle, end. Right. So it's a narrative arc, right? Yes. That starts with exposition, then raising and, and following action and conclusion. You talk about in the introduction, roller coaster designers, right? And this is really funny because I remember my experience in Atlantic City and I can definitely relate to that. So when, when reading about that, I remember that experience. So you go up, right? As you said, we are building up this energy and there is also a suspension at the peak. So you don't know what is going on. And I remember you also described that the music sometimes goes off. For example, roller coaster designers can design the experience in that way so that we may think, am I going to die? Something going <laughs> wrong here. So it's like even more dramatic. Yeah, so when you get to the top and you think what's going to happen, I'm going to slide back down or there is like a moment of suspension. So some of the key takeaways from this part is narrative arc, which is up and down pattern that starts with an exposition, rising and falling action, and then ends in a conclusion, right? And then you also give us different tools like hero's journey, which is basically a circular pattern that starts with a call to action. And then you have a guide who helps the hero, right? And then usually it ends in a new place or a transformation of the hero or something like that. Then also you talk about storyboard, which is basically telling stories with sequence of images rule of threes so here designers like to group things into three steps and usually the last one is more of a surprise and breaks the pattern we have also scenario planning which is tool for telling stories about the future so imagining all the possible scenarios that can happen and you also talk about design fiction which is you know making some speculative designs or prototypes to anticipate future trends let's talk about the second act which is a Emotions. Here you explore how design plays with our feelings and moods and associations, right? So we talk about how designers build empathy with users to create solutions that enhance their lives. So can you just speak to that? How to design in order to tap into people's emotions and feelings? That's a great question. So if you think about great storytelling, a great movie, a great novel, these things affect us emotionally. We're not just interested in what happened and why. We're actually interested in the characters and their investment in the story. And what typically happens when you watch a movie is that you become the character characters. You have empathy with the hero. And sometimes the hero is a despicable person like Walter White in Breaking Bad, right? Not someone that you want to have be your friend. But the storytelling actually brings you into his world and into his perspective and you end up rooting for the bad guy. And that's part of this magical flip of storytelling. And as designers, we often get stuck in our point of view as the designer, rather than thinking about the point of view of the people using what we create. And so that idea of empathy, of making that flip into the perspective of another person is a really powerful tool for designers. And it's part of design thinking, methodology, co-design, participatory design is all about bringing that user's perspective into the work that you do. And it's really an idea that comes from our most ancient art forms of storytelling, where we enter the perspective of another person. So that's really important. And there are tools for mapping people's emotional experience with a product. And this really comes out of literature as well. The idea that in a story, there's rising and falling action, but there's also rising and falling emotional 
There's periods of joy where everything's going great, but the story where everything's great is very boring, right? You need to have conflict and loss and uncertainty that have the story keep going. No, we are going to take a quick break here, but we'll be right back. Listen, my mission is to help people build and design iconic brands. So whether you're a business leader who wants to become more intentional with branding and all of its aspects, or you're a creative professional who wants to attract powerful clients and surely be able to help them with branding, then you need to start with a discovery session in order to develop a strategy that will inform all your creative work. And everything that you need in order to learn how to do that, you can find in my online courses at evecdesign.com slash show, where I share with you my worksheets, case studies, video tutorials, and other additional resources to help you feel safe and strong about your process. Now let's get back to our interview. Designers, it's a little different because we really don't want our users to suffer and have pain while using our product. So designers create emotional journey maps to anticipate where will be those emotional lows. What are people going to experience that they don't like? For example, when will I get my COVID-19 vaccine, right? All the waiting. So how do you turn the activity of waiting into an opportunity for learning something new or being entertained while you wait? (laughs) Having an explanation for what you're waiting for. That's why loaders on websites make it look like, well, something's happening in the background and your data is being processed and prepared. And it takes away that uncertainty of like, did it break? Are they still paying attention to me? Have I been abandoned? in here. And so those kind of tools are really empathizing with the user and making sure that they're kind of carried along in an emotional story. So give us a lot of tools here, actually. So can we talk about some of them? You just mentioned emotional journey, some of other tools is co-creation, personas, creating personas, using emojis, using color and emotion. Can we talk about some, maybe, maybe color and emotion? I think that would be really interesting. Personas, that's something that I think a lot of designers can relate to as well. So using color, we sometimes think of color as being an aesthetic choice. I like blue, you like red, you know, these are our favorite colors. But colors also carry an emotional weight. And so the color blue is often used for healthcare or banking, right? It feels clean, it feels authoritative. And that's related to blue being used in flags and sort of official communication. Um, But blue can also be associated with the blues, feeling low, right? And it's a color that we think of as cold, even though it has no physical temperature, right? We think of it as a cold color and we think of yellows and oranges as red colors. So as designers, we make choices about color that can relate to the symbolic importance of a color, but also to associations people have with colors being related to people feelings, feelings of love or feelings of lowness. For example, the smiley face is always yellow. (laughs) And there's this historic connection between yellow and happiness and making things bright and sunny and happy. But yellow also means danger. So it has, depending on your context, you can play into these more symbolic official meanings of a color and these sort of softer emotional associations. I think it's great as designers is to think more intentionally about how we use color, right? To think about what kind of effect you're trying to get. And that means thinking about users and thinking about how will they respond? What is their feeling going to be when they enter a room that's all yellow or see a handle on a tool that's yellow, which often means, you know, danger and caution and visibility, right? Making something easy to see. And I think what's really interesting here for you, you guys can check this out. So for example, here you break down what red color actually means. It can mean many different things depending on where you live basically right so in our western fairy tales can mean love sexual maturity in greek mythology is mars god of war and so on in china for example china india and nepal is bridal wear right so it can mean fire it can mean blood it can mean love adventure in korea and it is a color of coca-cola so i really explore here in 
this part, you know, meaning of color and how to use color, right, to our advantage, to be more intentional, as you said, in everything we design. How about we talk about persona? I think this is quite interesting. I think this is one of the key tools from this part and just pertaining to what you were talking about earlier, that we need to step into the shoes of the users and look from their perspective, right? So can you just talk about creating personas, you know, demographics, psychographics, and so on? So great stories have great characters. A great character isn't only always good. A great character makes mistakes. A great character has flaws. A great character has a fatal weakness. So when we think about personas, this is a tool that's widely used by designers where a character is created. And this character reflects actual problems and issues and desires that potential users of the product might have. And so typically in the design process, one creates multiple personas because if you only have one, then you're idealizing this kind of perfect user who's like often a handsome white guy. <laughs> And you need to have this range of people. A really good persona is made from interviewing actual human beings who are in the user group of your product. Designers don't always do that. They don't always have time to do all the research to really meet the right people. But even a more simple persona becomes a reminder to the team working on a project who the people are. Typically, the team will name these personas, you know, Bob, Jane, and Maya, so that when you're talking about a new feature or talking about how the product will be marketed, you can think about the needs of these kind of idealized characters, the characters in the story of your product. So the takeaway is that we should create different personas, right? Because we have a variety of different users. It's not only about one. We can have one main persona per Perhaps, but usually what happens is different people are going to use our products or designs or whatever we're working on. So we need to include them all and think about different personas. And therefore, as you mentioned, we create them, we give them a name. So it seems real to us in the process. And then we can focus on demographics, who are they, their psychographics, and so on to make some decisions on different key elements of visual language and designing an experience or designing an app or whatever we're working on. How about emojis? You talk quite a lot about emojis as well. Can we just touch on that? Well, emojis are just a really fun part of contemporary life. And I think that they satisfy a need that people have. Everyday users, everybody, all of us use emojis. And it's because we want to find more depth in our communication. And so being able to have a piece of sushi or the devil or a skull, <laughs> these are more powerful to many people than just using words. So I think right. designers have a lot to learn from just the fact that emoji are so popular. And you can get into designing emoji and different platforms and companies have their own custom emoji, which is neat. And people get political about emoji and have a lobby to have new emoji added to the vocabulary of icons. And it's a really great area of communication that has yes. emotion at its core. Yeah, so we can use emojis basically to trigger emotion as well. Okay, so let's talk about the third act, which is sensation. And here you focus more on perception and cognition. So can you just walk us through some of the key tools of this third act where you talk about sensation? Everything designed is experienced by people in a temporal way, time. So we think of something like a logo or a poster as being just flat, right? It's on a flat surface and it's not moving, it's not doing anything. And yet the way people see something is your eyes are constantly moving. My eyes are moving while I'm looking at you. If I look at a page of type, my eye has to actually follow a very specific path in order to make sense of the type. But for designers to, to understand a little bit about the experience of reading, the experience of seeing, that there's always a path. Our eye is always moving from A to B. And as a designer, you can be deliberate about where you place the most important content or a joke 
that's revealed, right? Something that's funny that somebody discovers as they look at a piece. And so this time can be very fast. It can be a second, or it can be something that has a lot of duration, like traveling through a website or watching a video where there's a long time spent looking at something. So time is very important. And then the idea that people experience design, not just with their eyes, but there's also a sense of touch and sound, atmosphere, Sphere. And of course, this is especially important with experience design, with a retail space, an exhibition, a package. You talked about unboxing, right? The whole process of revealing something over time. And so thinking about sensation is very important. And it brings us back to color because certain colors are associated with, you know, the smell of flowers or the color of birthday cake or coffee, right? The kind of rich and more of coffee and a coffee shop versus a very bright, shiny, hard place. And so sensation is another really key part of storytelling because when I watch a movie or read a wonderful novel, I'm not just following the action of what somebody is doing. I actually feel like I'm there, right? You talked about the roller coaster and the physical feeling of being on a roller coaster. Well, if I watch a movie about a roller coaster, I can also get some of that physical feeling. When something shocking happens in a movie, you jump back. Your whole body reacts. When there's a romantic scene and people are touching each other, you get a feeling of warmth, of this physical warmth of, of these bodies touching. And so this sensory experience is essential to a good story. And as designers, we can do more than just appeal to the eye. We can also appeal to these kind of bigger embodied feelings. Right. So it's basically going beyond that. And some of the key tools, we have the gaze, which you just mentioned, that we need to attract the gaze of users and we can guide them. As I mentioned, we can look here and there. For example, when we look at the website, we don't just read everything from top to bottom. We just scroll it down, up and down, and we look at some places. So you can use color and form and some design elements to actually attract users' gaze, right? Mm -hmm. And attract their attention to a specific part of, of a website, for example. Then you also talk about Gestalt principles, which I think is really interesting, especially for graphic designers. So here you talk about some of the designers may know about that. Some of the designers who are just starting out see this for the first time. It's quite interesting. For example, like similarity, proximity, closure, symmetry, and so on. Some of the key form of visual expression that you can use, you know, get inspired by and using your designs. Also, you talk about affordance, which is basically about objects that trigger an action, right? So it could be a button. Buttons are for clicking, right? Menus are for scrolling. Pages are for flipping and so on. So those are all actions. Right. Right. Those are all things that people do. So scrolling through a website is an action and I have to make the effort to do it. Right, I have to be enticed to scroll beyond the first page. I have to be motivated to click a button. I have to be motivated to turn the page of a magazine. But I love what you just said because those are all physical actions that people do with their body and that the design has to invite that. It has to be obvious. I have to know that it's a button. I have to know it's something I can interact with. I don't want to be surprised. Something suddenly flips and I didn't intend for that to happen. Those are really cool examples because they are so physical. Right. And some of the other tools you, you talk about in this part is behavioral economics, which is basically about you break down how people make decisions and how they come to their gut feeling. And also you talk about multisensory design which you just touched on that. It's about going beyond, you know, design's traditional focus on vision. We're going beyond that and incorporating other senses, you know, touch, smell, and things like that. And I really like at the beginning, in the introduction, you talk about Segmeister, right? I just want to hear that from you. I think that's really interesting. Sure. You make an argument about why graphic design is storytelling. And I think that would be interesting for our listeners to, to hear about that. Sure. So I was at a dinner and a young man was across the table from me and he asked me what I was working on. I said, oh, I'm doing a book about storytelling. And he said to me, very serious, very worried. He said, have you heard about Sagmeister? Well, yeah, I know who Sagmeister is. What's the thing? Well, and he told me that 
you know, he had seen this video and the Sagmeister had complained about a roller coaster designer. And this roller coaster designer had described his work as storytelling. And Sagmeister was very annoyed by this because he felt, why can't it just be designing roller coasters? <laughs> why do we have to sort of layer everything with storytelling? And yet we started our conversation with this. Mm -hmm. A roller coaster is the archetype of a story, right? The shape of it, the energy, the rising and falling action. Yes. And the roller coaster designers actually build on the innate physics of going up and down the hill on a track. They add to that the sound effects, the music, making you stop at the top, delaying. A lot of storytelling movies, you know, are about delaying the action, like making you have Right. That's part of the excitement. They'll add a theme. It's not just a roller coaster. It's also a waterfall or it's a Western adventure or it's Space Mountain. And here's, right? a, <laughs> and here's a beautiful illustration just to show you guys. So really, Alan actually breaks that down so you can see what we are talking about. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, so... You know, I appreciate Stefan Sagmeister's idea that graphic design, isn't it enough that it's graphic design? Isn't it enough that it's a roller coaster? And yet I feel that there is so much that we can learn. And really my book is about learning and being inspired by principles which are essential to the art forms that appeal to people the most, right? Storytelling is as old as human beings. It's a lot older than graphic design. <laughs> And it has these structures and ideas that are so valuable to us. So the idea of action, right? So graphic design, it shouldn't just sit there. Centered type in the middle of the page has no movement. It has no action. And that's why we add asymmetry or put something on an angle or create some interruption, some element of surprise that comes from stories. The notion of a threshold. In a story, you are entering a new world, right? You are sitting in your armchair, but you turn on the TV or you open a book and now you are somewhere else, right? A new world and a work of design, a website, a product, an exhibition, even a poster is a kind of window or portal into a new world. We want to bring people into a new space, a mental space. And the idea of empathy, which is what stories do, right? Is to put you in the shoes of the hero, to make you a new person to experience life as a new person empathy is just such an important idea for designers so with that we're gonna wrap up so as we are approaching the end of our interview of course i'm gonna link to that book in the description box but i just wanted to ask you if you can just let us know whether it is for designers who want to learn more from you how we can get in touch with you or maybe other teachers who want to learn more about your work and get inspired in their teaching you know about your work so how can we get sure. what's the best way to get in touch with you you can follow me on instagram or twitter at ellen lupton you can email me ellen lupton at micah dot edu i have many books this is just one of them i have a book all about designing for the senses it's a book called the senses i have a book about design for healthcare that came out in 2020 i have a new book coming out in 2021 about design and feminism and inclusion and anti-racism it's a book called extra bold co-authored with six other amazing writers about creating a more inclusive design world so there's lots of great books to read um and i I'd love to be in touch with everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. And sharing with us some of your Thank you. Thanks for having me, Eric. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. So thanks for tuning in. And if you've enjoyed this episode of Home Branding Podcast, follow me on social media for more tips on branding, strategy, and design. It was Eric Vornichak from Evil Design. And I will see you in the next one.